Hi, everyone. Um, so this talk is really going to be in two parts. And the first part is going to be you know, a little bit more higher level, looking at modern applications, what they are, and what the best ways are to build them today. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot about serverless, because most of the applications I build these days are using serverless in some shape or form. Then I'm going to look at some of the more technical details. So what does it mean to build serverless applications with JavaScript? And then, you know, what are the challenges? There's always challenges with new technologies and ado adopting new patterns. So what are they? How can we overcome them? And I'm going to try and show then some uh, varying kind of recipes for doing stuff effectively with serverless. So what is a modern application? What does it look like? Well, these days, modern applications tend to have to be scalable. You don't have to have a billion users, but you might scale in some dimensions. So it might be you know, a stream of data coming from IoT devices, or it might be that you've just kind of got large variances in scale. So these days, we're expected to be able to handle sudden bursts in user consumption. And we're also a lot more user focused. Users are a lot more savvy. Uh, we keep them in the loop a lot more. We don't try and write all the requirements up front and predict them. Instead, uh, we work a lot more with users. We try and create hypotheses about users' behavior. And then we try and build stuff as quickly as possible so that we can test that hypothesis and either proceed with it or ditch it. And then our systems also have to be very reliable and secure in uh, today's environments. We also need to look at incorporating intelligence into our applications. So either you know, whether that's machine learning or data science or complex analytics. Um, but the, really, I suppose the key things about modern application is not necessarily the features or the technical constraints around them. Uh, it's more really about getting fast to market, because everybody's got the tools to deploy software very quickly, really. Your competitors do. So time to market and speed of iteration is very important. And the ability to experiment is really critical, actually. And software companies that succeed the most today are the best at doing low-cost experimentation and putting experiments out into production and measuring them effectively. So given all of that, I assume that everybody's come to QCon you know, to up their game, to find out you know, what, is the, what is the latest and greatest in building a modern application. So let's look at like, what are the tools, what are the methods you could use uh, to build the ideal modern application. So you, could... <laughs> you might laugh, right? But 60% <laughs> of websites on the internet apparently build with WordPress. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's proven, it's open source. Uh, it's been stable for a long time. You know, it's not very trendy. It's not great for the CV to build it with WordPress, uh, maybe. So that might be a bit of a downside. So you might go a little bit more extreme and pick something like Haskell. You know, Haskell is purest of pure languages, right? If you want to get something into production that you know works, that's got proven, you know, it's mathematically proven that you've got no bugs in it, uh, then you can go with an approach like that. But for some reason, despite the guarantees around correctness that you get with the Haskell, it hasn't been adopted by the masses. Um, because it's seen as a little bit scary, right? And, uh, and difficult to take on. So you might go for something a little bit more um, pragmatic, something like Rails or Django. Rails and Django are, are, are popular because they are, you know, they're pragmatic, they enable good developer productivity, and they allow you to get stuff into production very, very fast. And you know, for a while it was all the rage, and people were doing great productive things with Rails. And it was really a perception around performance and scalability that stopped Rails becoming uh, you know, adopted by the masses in the extreme. So then we moved into you know, looking at scalable distributed microservices. And if you wanted to go along that route, you might do something like build your system with Erlang. I mean, we talk about microservices all the time, and we're kind of figuring our way through microservices as if it's the first time this has ever been done. But Erlang was doing fault-tolerant distributed scalable microservices in the 1980s. Um, WhatsApp built their system on Erlang, and they were able to scale to 2 million concurrent connections on one single server. So it's interesting to understand like, and look at this and say, why haven't we adopted uh, technology like this? And I think it's largely down to the fact that you know, it's, it's too much of a reach into the past. Uh, people like to take stepping stones from the technology they're working with today so instead, people move from you know, doing monolithic Java applications or Go or C Sharp, .NET applications into doing you know, Erlang-like patterns with microservices. And that's what brings us to, I suppose, the predominant patterns today, which is using you know, container orchestration systems, 
um, and doing microservices at scale with Kubernetes. Of course, you know, with Kubernetes, um, I suppose the emergent problems coming out, coming out of that space are that you know, you've got a lot of infrastructure to maintain and you end up spending a lot of time thinking about that and not necessarily the function that sits on the top. So then there's the idea I'm putting forward today, which is to build all your systems using serverless and to code them in JavaScript. Let's just think about that for a second, right? I mean, the idea there is that you componentize your software into the tiniest, smallest pieces, and you distribute them all over the network so you introduce as much latency as possible. Uh, and then you relinquish uh, control to the cloud provider uh, for the majority of your system. And not only that, but you take a language that was invented in 1995 and developed in 10 days for Netscape, and you decide to use that language to implement it all in. So why would you do this? Um, why would you choose something that's so, you know, unclean? Right? It feels like so unfit fit for purpose. Why wouldn't you use a safer, uh, purer language and an eco ecosystem with more safety guarantees? I suppose because, you know, we've kind of learned over time that perfect systems don't really work out very well. Um, I've spent a lot of time trying to architect, you know, elegant systems that people can use in a generic way and which will provide guarantees around productivity and um, speed to market and uh, architectural, uh, you know, cater for architectural growth into the future as well. But it doesn't really work like that. When you're trying to build perfect systems and then you look at the reality of how developers actually take them and adopt them and use them, um, you know, it never really works out well. It only, you know, the, the theory behind uh, these theoretical fra frameworks and underpinnings uh, never really plays out in reality. And there's always trade-offs, and you just, you know, it's about kind of accepting those trade-offs. I mean, when we're building software systems, it's not just about having elegant architecture and elegant code. It's about uh, how productive are you with it, the availability of skills, um, you know, the community around it, uh, the tooling available to it. Um, so perfect, perfect software doesn't always build perfect systems, right? We're, um, we're trying to build, you know, we're not trying to build beautiful looking code, we're actually trying to build meaningful user experiences. So um, I wanted to give one story about the pursuit of perfection, which uh, um, I think it's, it's quite a famous one, so you might have heard of it. But uh, I, think it's, I think it's an interesting story. So in 1975 in Cologne in Germany, there was, um, there was a young jazz fan called Vera Brandes. And she was uh, really into jazz and she wanted to encourage the popularity of jazz in Germany. So she decided to book some concerts. And she booked um, you know, up and coming but already quite famous solo improvis improvisational pianist called Keith Jarrett. And, um, she managed to sell 1,700 tickets for the Opera House for his concert. Now, Keith Jarrett was a total perfectionist. I mean, this was a guy who used to give cough drops out to his audience so they wouldn't cough and interrupt. Um, and he requested a very specific model of grand piano for his performance. Uh, but he arrived on the day of the performance uh, completely exhausted from his European tour and turned up at the Opera House with his manager. And they checked out the piano, and it was a total disaster. I mean, the, the piano wasn't even a grand piano. It was a baby grand, so it wasn't even going to carry the sound to the back of the opera house. Um, and as well as that, it was like a rehearsal piano, so it was in awful condition. It was, it was damaged. It was out of tune. Felt was missing from some of the hammers, so some of the high notes sounded just awful. And he said, no way, I'm not playing this. And he walked out of the theater. Uh, so this 17-year-old budding jazz promoter was left there with 1,700 tickets sold. She didn't know what to do. So she chased him. She ran after him out onto the street and begged and pleaded with him to give his concert. And you know, eventually he took pity on her and relented. He went back inside. Uh, they managed to tune the piano, but you know, they couldn't get another one. So he had to proceed with the tools he was, get, he was given. Um, and he had a sound recording team with him. They were recording all of his concerts, and they were saying, 
there's no point in recording this, right? But they said, let's do it anyway. It'll be evidence of what disaster looks like, if nothing else. So he went ahead and he gave his concert. And because he had to work around the tools he was given, and not with the tools he was given, he was pushed way outside of his comfort zone. And what that meant was that he had to resort to all sorts of things to try and work with the instrument. Like he was standing up, hammering on the keys to try and make sure that the sound would carry. He had to avoid the upper register and you know, do things he wouldn't normally do. And something happened uh, in the creative process. And that the recording of that album, not only was it released, it actually went on to become the number one selling jazz solo performance in history. And it also became the number one selling piano solo album in history. And you know, I think it's an interesting parallel. It might seem very far from the topic, right? But ultimately, software engineering is quite a creative discipline, more so probably than an engineering one. So we have to think about how the tools not only enable us to do our work, but how sometimes when they push us outside of our comfort zone, they can actually stimulate us into new levels of creativity that force us to do new things and innovate in ways that working with perfect underlying systems doesn't. So going back to the topic a little bit, what that actually means is, if you look at serverless as a concept, it was developed by accident. I mean, nobody decided, let's go and make, design all these components to make what we now call serverless. It emerged from the failings, the successes of the technologies that went before it. You know, the emergence, the development of cloud over time, first as utility instances, um, then we started doing microservices. And microser microservices uh, got us comfortable with the idea of very small components. Then we started adding things like infrastructure as code in order to manage that. And as we do that, we ended up with more and more infrastructure complexity. You know, container orchestration, service discovery, circuit breakers, all of this stuff that you have to do in order to run microservices at scale emerged. Then functions as a service kind of came out as like an afterthought almost. Initially, it was about providing small level, uh, an ability to execute code without bringing up any containers or any instances. But it wasn't necessarily about let's suddenly move all of our business logic into functions. It was really there as a cloud utility. And AWS Lambda was released, you know, almost as an experiment to see how the users would adopt it. And what happened was that everybody kind of rushed to it. You know, people started using it for you know, simple things around the edges, like doing backups, uh, cron jobs, that sort of thing. But suddenly they realized that it made them a lot more productive uh, for doing a lot more than just that. And at the same time, managed services uh, grew and grew in their numbers and in their capability, such that we could actually start ditching a lot of the code that we write, a lot of the custom code that we do to do all the undifferentiated stuff that everybody has to do when you're deploying software in the cloud. So the features of a serverless system then are, number one, I would say managed services. I mean, people look almost equate serverless and functions, but that's not really how I perceive it. Um, serverless is about a wide variety of managed services and you know, on-demand managed compute in the form of a Lambda function is just one of those services. It, it's not necessarily the defining characteristic of a serverless system. Uh, serverless systems are then also very much event-driven. So rather than having one service call another explicitly and having synchronous chains of calls and having that tight coupling between systems, we try to develop components as very isolated components and tie them together in an asynchronous ma manner. We also ensure you pay only for what you use. Okay, this is a defining characteristic of serverless. Um, also, you don't have any idling infrastructure. So if you're not using it, there's nothing running. Um, and ultimately, what that leads to then is less code. And that's a really serious goal in software development, less code means fewer bugs, less code means less cost of maintenance, less code means you, know, you don't tend to have that 
uh, continuation bias, you know, when you've, uh, when you've written a large body of code and you feel like you put so much effort into it that you just have to keep maintaining it, keep adding to it. When you've got less code, small systems, it means you're much more um, comfortable with actually throwing it out and redoing it, which is a fantastic thing. So how does JavaScript fit into the world of serverless then? Well, in many ways, JavaScript kind of has no right to be the top language for serverless. Um, on the face of it, it seems quite unsuitable. But if we step back and look at why JavaScript is so popular it is today uh, on the back end, let's look at the success of Node. So Node.js was really good for developer productivity. You know, it was, it was like uh, a bit like Jared's piano, you know, it, with, for all its flaws, uh, it took people out of their comfort zone, but also gave them a lot of creative freedom because it doesn't put a lot of barriers or friction or unnecessary ceremony in your way. But Node uh, was initially really successful because of event-driven I.O. And that was its initial selling point. It was about having, um, it was about you know, solving the problems that, we see, that people saw with Rails from before and you know, the inability to scale to large numbers of concurrent connections. Node allowed you to scale to large volumes of concurrent connections and had a very elegant solution to do that using uh, an event loop and asynchronous event-driven I.O. To, to manage it. And then the fact that it was on a single thread means you don't have to worry about con concurrency issues, which is another piece of friction that can tie people up in knots in other languages. Um, so again, that helps developer productivity. And then of course the module ecosystem, as we discussed earlier today, um, just helped the whole platform to just blossom. Um, developers love small components. You know, I think we've kind of all got tired of using large frameworks that, take, uh, that are very unwieldy to adopt and to manage and to configure. And the ability to pick and choose small modules makes developers product, productive and it keeps, gives you that kind of control and creative freedom at the same time. So easy to understand because each component should have a single specific purpose. They're easy to find, create, destroy, and replace. Uh, so it may, means the ability again to do that low cost experimentation and move very quickly. Um, so why is it a good fit for serverless then? Well, in one way, it's not necessarily, right? Uh, I talked about the ability to, for Node to scale to multiple concurrent connections. Um, you know, it's a bit amusing really, but in a serverless context, you have a, an event coming in and one Node process handles one event at any given time. So it seems completely unsuitable from that perspective. You don't even need a HTTP server in a Node context. Instead, uh, typically with a Lambda function, you just get an event in, and that event can be driven by a HTTPI uh, on the front of it. As well, its lack of types might also make it unsuitable, right? Because if you want to test your uh, Lambda function in a realistic uh, cloud environment, you have to deploy it. If you have to deploy it before you run it very uh, carefully, you know, you get it before you run it in order to get feedback on it, then a lack of types might mean you know the actual developer feedback loop on correctness of your code is quite slow. But at the same time, Node is very fast to start. Uh, you know, it's one of the fastest runtimes available to start. Um, it's very fast runtime, so it's very good, very good performance and a low memory overhead as well. Um, you don't have a compilation step. And when you're developing these small components and iterating quickly, taking a compilation step out of it is actually a big advantage. Of course, you might have a transpilation step, uh, which is another story altogether. Um, but you can still get to take advantage of that huge module ecosystem. You know, all of the knowledge that's out there, all of the collective knowledge that's used both on the front end and in back end uh, node development is available to you when you're deploying systems into the cloud. And specifically with NPM, the majority of those modules are very, very small, which makes them very well suited for deployment in a functions as a service environment. And you've got the familiarity and the ubiquity of the language. Uh, so the skills are, are available. Um, it's, you know, developing in, apart from, you know, things that you now can dispense with, such as your Express or your Happy Server. Um, you don't need to bother with that. Um, but, you know, you've still got um, all of the, the rest of the ecosystem that you can still leverage and use in a Lambda function. 
is still highly productive. And the last one there, you know, I think is the most underrated actual benefit of using Node.js uh, in backend development, particularly in microservices and in web applications. And that's that the best language for processing JSON is JavaScript. Uh, there's no ceremony to it. It maps perfectly to JavaScript objects. So then if you're doing the kind of things you do very frequently in functions as a service, like mapping data from one format to another, or say, um, you know, doing some translation on JSON objects, uh, JavaScript is the lowest ceremony overhead of anything to do that. Um, so we know that Node is the leader in uh, deployments in serverless functions. This study came out a couple of weeks ago from New Relic, and it shows that uh, over 52% of their monitored Lambda functions uh, were running in Node. And Python, it's probably no, um, no coincidence that Python, another dynamic language, is, uh, is in second place. And this might change, actually, because of you know, performance benefits and improvements in the other runtimes. Um, but Node is still you know, a significant leader uh, in this space. So given all of that then, should you choose now JavaScript uh, for your serverless deployments? You know, not necessarily, I would say. Uh, the reason, one of the main reasons I do it, actually, is because that's what I was using before. Um, it makes me very productive. But you know, if you're not a JavaScript developer, or if you hate JavaScript with a passion, as I know many people do, then you know, there's no point in forcing yourself, while you have to learn all of the other new things around serverless, there's no point in forcing yourself into adopting JavaScript just because most other people do. Um, one of our customers. Um, OK, so now we're actually looking at what does a Node.js function look like in a serverless context. So I've got a very simple example here to start things off. Um, so I've built a simple API that will find accommodation for you to stay in Ireland. So I found an open public data set, which is a CSV file of all the hotels and B&Bs in Ireland. And um, we're going to build an API to query that and serve results back. And we're going to filter that data set by county. So this is the Lambda function itself. The function is a lookup function. And like all Lambda functions, the first argument it takes is the event. And like I was saying, with JavaScript, you can use nice things like uh, destructuring uh, to extract fields out of that. So we're taking the county out of the query string parameters. Uh, we then pass that into the find accommodation library and return the result, which is a JSON array, a JavaScript array, uh, and a 200 status code. So then the actual implementation itself um, you know, is an interesting kind of quirky one I picked uh, for this example. Uh, it's not necessarily how you would do it in production. Uh, but what we're doing is we're, we want to filter out from the CSV file. In real life, you might use a database. In this case, I'm actually fetching the object from S3. So the CSV file just sits in a location on an S3 bucket. Uh, but I'm using something called uh, S3 select, which is an ability to query CSV files or Parquet files or JSON files in S3 and have that query performed within the bucket itself so that you don't have to transfer the data set back. So this CSV file is quite small. It's like half a megabyte or something. Uh, but this is really useful if you've got big volumes of data and you're trying to pull data back for pro processing. Uh, so we, we initialize the AWS SDK to the JavaScript SDK. We create an S3 client. And then we're invoking the select object content with a SQL query. Um, so that gives us back a, a stream. Uh, that gives, gives us back a Node.js stream. And we're collecting the data in that stream, uh, parsing it, and returning it as a JavaScript array. So that's all of the code. Um, and this is how we deploy it. So this is the serverless framework we're using in this case. It's the most popular framework by far for deploying uh, serverless applications, but there are many other alternatives. <clears throat> um, so at the bottom, we've defined our function. So it's a lookup function. It can be found in the handler module, and it's, the function is called lookup itself. Uh, we're passing in some environment variables, and then we're specifying what kind of events trigger this function. In this case, it's an API gateway with a HTTP GET request. At the top, then, we're defining you know, our general AWS Cloud Provider configuration. So we're saying this is going to be a regional endpoint. It's going to be uh, served, optimized generally for people within the EU region. Um, we've turned on tracing for both the API and the Lambda function. 
I'll talk a little bit more about that in a while. Uh, serverless Framework is going to create cloud formation log groups. So all our logs go in there. We're setting a retention on that to seven days uh, because it costs money and you don't want to keep them forever necessarily. And then the most important part probably is that uh, we're defining our principle of least for privilege permissions, which is this function only needs to access one object in one bucket. So that's all it has access to. So we serverless deploy that environment and then we get an API endpoint and we can make get requests against that and it returns our uh, results. So some of the things you get with that deployment then, I'm just showing a few examples of the kind of things that you automatically get when you deploy a simple function like that. Uh, on the top left, we have the API logs in CloudWatch. On the bottom, you get uh, the distribution of the response times in your API, so you can map how uh, long your requests are taking. And on the top right, we've got the service map. So this is coming from X-Ray, and I'll show more about that in a little while. But it's basically building a map of our components and showing the traffic and the data as it flows through the system along with the response times and stuff. So that's a quite a simple example, but as with all simple examples, they're very misleading. And when you go to deploy serverless at scale in production, there's a whole other set of problems. You know, um, it's a very different way of thinking than building software using other paradigms. Definitely, definitely de different to monoliths, also different to just building microservices. So there's a learning curve there. It's still quite early days, so best practices have yet to be established, and it's a moving target, so it's, it's evolving fast all the time. And that can be a benefit right, um, as well as a, as, as a challenge. Um, and with that comes then organizational change because expertise in a particular cloud provider you're using is really essential in your team. Uh, so that means potentially changing the structure of your teams and you know, ensuring you've got that good DevOps best practices and you've got, you know, there's, there's hundreds of cloud resources, there's complexity in configuring each one of them and that knowledge has to be there somewhere. Um, and you know, as with new, adopting any new technology, you've got this kind of roller coaster effect where you start off and everything seems wonderful, and you deploy your first system, and you know you're delighted with yourself, uh, and you think you're invincible, and then you deploy to production, and all the real world effects start happening, uh, and then you've got this despair when you realize how difficult things are to actually optimize, and you discover that every single service you use actually has failure modes, and you have to understand those failure modes and react to them. And you know, that's a, that's a roller coaster, and it's inevitable. Uh, but you know, at our, our company, Four Theorem, we've been doing serverless systems for a while now, and we've kind of ridden that roller coaster, I'd say, a few times, and um, managed to smooth out the bumps uh, over time. Well, one of the ways we did that was by taking all of the learnings we had and putting it into a template project. So I was saying that one of the great benefits of serverless is that you've got creative freedom. Um, with that means that you've got a lot of decisions to make in terms of how you assemble your system, how you put things together. So it's, it's actually you know, quite daunting at the start and it's something that can slow you down. Uh, so we decided to take this kind of opinionated approach for you know, kind of 80% of those decisions to m allow us to bootstrap these projects quicker. We also decided then to open source this and make it available to everybody and try and make it replicate a production environment as, 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 close, uh, as close to a production environment as we could. <clears throat> so these are some of the things that the project um, aims to provide an answer for. These are all considerations you need to kind of make at one stage or another when you're building you know, a production-grade serverless application. So there's quite a lot in there. And um, the project, which is called Slick Starter, um, has a, an answer for an element of each one of these things. So you can find it on GitHub. Um, you can search for it just by Slick Starter. You can go to slick.app and it will take you straight to the GitHub page. The application itself, uh, you know, the demo, it comes with a full demo application with a front end and a back end and you can deploy it and, and use it. It's an application for managing checklists so you can create checklists, you can sign up for an account, create lists, uh, create entries in those checklists and mark them off. Um, the intention is basically to provide, to provide you with an application that you can quickly disassemble, start adding your own features to, and really just pick and choose the components that are, are kind of relevant to you. 
You can also just take it and just use it as a learning resource. You don't necessarily have to base your project on it. But, you know, a typical workflow is that people will take the repo, uh, clone it or import the code into their own repo and start chopping bits out and adding new features in. And you can use all the features that were there just as an, as a, an, an example, if you like. So this on the front end side, you can sign up, plug in, create and manage these uh, checklists, uh, go in, edit the checklists, check them off. And there's some event-driven flows in there as well, like when you create a list, it will send you an email um, congratulating you for creating a list. So just a couple of things about the project then. So it targets AWS only right now, just because it's easier uh, to maintain. It's what we deal with most of the time. And um, it's, you know, it's easier for, for us to be productive on the project by just uh, building on top of AWS. So this is what the architecture diagram for the whole project looks like. There's about seven or eight services in the project. Um, and they're all kind of single responsibility, single purpose components. Um, so for example, you've got a service dedicated to sending that welcome message. Uh, and that reacts in an asynchronous way to an event now, when we're building events in a serverless application, there's generally, you know, we try to leverage cloud-managed event services for everything, not just events. But in terms of AWS, that generally boils down to SQS or SNS, um, Kinesis, and EventBridge. And the reasons you choose one over the other, basically for point-to-point -point communication, we'd use SQS. So the email service accepts messages from other services on a queue and it owns that queue. And once a service has dropped a message to be delivered onto that queue, it's essentially guaranteed to be delivered at some point in the future. Uh, when you've got PubSub messaging, then you would use, um, we tend not to use SNS so much anymore, uh, but use EventBridge instead. The difference with EventBridge is that EventBridge doesn't have to belong to any specific service. It's always there. You can just create events and push them onto the event bus and you don't have to do anything with them until you're ready to consume them. And then other services will use essentially pattern matching to pick up those events and react to them. So it's very powerful uh, and very flexible. Uh, so in this case, the checklist service just emits lifecycle events. Somebody's created a list, somebody's deleted a list. Um, and if other services want to react to those lifecycle events, they can just say, I want to list to all events relating to checklists where the uh, pattern event type starts with created, for example. Um, so they just essentially create that pattern matching rule, and then the service responds to that, and it triggers a Lambda function. So the other option then I referred to was Kinesis. And if you're doing high volume real time events uh, where you want time ordered uh, stream of events at high throughput rates, that's where you'd use Kinesis. Um, much, much in a similar way to where you would use Kafka, but it's, I suppose it's a lot um, simpler and more bare bones than a, than a Kafka context. Um, typically, what, the way we would deploy this is using the best practices of separating each environment into separate accounts. So a separate one for staging, development accounts, and then your tooling account. But you can also deploy this into a single account just to get going and see how it performs. All of the services themselves are deployed using the serverless framework. But then for some elements, we use something called the CDK, which is really interesting. So in AWS, there's a couple of different ways to create the resources you're using. One is just you know, clicking around through the console. It's not a very scalable or reliable way to do it. Um, you can also use the command line or the SDK to create things. And then there's cloud formation. And realistically, if you're doing an AWS only application, cloud formation is really, in my opinion, the way to do it. Uh, you can use other things like Terraform. The advantage with cloud formation, in my opinion, is you know, it collects all of your resources that belong together into a single stack, which is deployed and rolled back as a unit. Uh, so that's quite powerful when you're managing deployments. Um, but you do that in JSON or YAML. And this is just an example for an S3 bucket. But as your deployment grows, the amount of YAML you have to maintain becomes very unwieldy and very difficult to maintain. And it's also you know, very error prone. You know, you've no validation in there. So that's where the CDK comes in. Uh, so this is an example of some TypeScript we use to create uh, some of the resources for the CI-CD pipeline. 
So CDK is written in TypeScript itself, but they've got um, a tool that actually creates bindings for Java, C Sharp, and Python. And the great benefit of it is that it gives you a type safe, programmatic, imperative way to build your resources. So if you've got uh, any kind of dynamic behavior within your resources, you can do for loops, uh, you can do if statements, and you can create resources conditionally. So in this case, we're actually creating our deployment pipeline and we're saying, let's create a pipeline for each model, module, which is a dynamic array of modules, because you can add modules to your system, and create each one for both staging and production. And then it's, you don't have to repeat that code. If you were doing it in YAML, you'd probably have to do you know, copy-paste or some ugly hack uh, to get that to be deployed. But the really nice thing then is that you don't have to switch between cloud formation, documentation, and your editor. Everything is, you know, leverages the autocomplete and the inline documentation of your editor. Uh, so it's a much more productive way to build resources, in my opinion. And even if you ultimately want to use YAML as the source of truth for your cloud resources, you could just like use the CDK to generate that in the first instance and maintain it thereafter. Um, yeah, so continuous deployment is essential in servers, right? Um, you, you can't really get away with it. Uh, I suppose in, in a lot of environments, you can't re really get away with it these days, but particularly so in serverless when you're talking about having you know, lots and lots of small units of deployment. Um, so this is a graphical you know, architecture diagram for the CI CD pipeline we, we generate using TypeScript. Um, it creates the module pipeline for each module in your service, and then creates an orchestrator pipeline uh, to manage all of them. We typically deploy that from a mono repo, um, just really for simplicity and to avoid the overhead of managing multiple repositories, uh, which can introduce its own, own troubles. And the way we do that is by having a change detection script at the start of the pipeline, which figures out which modules have changed, and then is able to run the build modules for each module in parallel. Um, so one of the other things I wanted to talk about and, and demonstrate in a serverless context is observability. Um, so I suppose for, for, to clarify the difference between mon plain old monitoring and observability, I mean monitoring is about you know, having insight into your system so that you can tell when known problems occur. But observability is about having the outputs from your system uh, rich enough so that you can answer any arbitrary question about your system, including asking questions when unknown problems occur. What that means is about collecting very rich structured data throughout your system and having it correlated to events. So a very simple first step in that is producing structured logs. Uh, we use Pino for that. I think JavaScript, again, is the best kind of uh, fit for creating structured JSON logs. It's very simple. Um, and we also Im integrate the MIDI um, serverless framework, which is a very simple middleware framework that allows you to automatically add uh, before and after handlers to your Lambda functions. So it can log your events, it can log errors automatically for you. You can do a lot of other cool stuff, but it integrates into the logger to make sure you can get you know, info level debugging in production, but maybe also some sampling on debug logs too. And then we collect those in a centralized log repository. Um, you can use a third-party repository, but CloudWatch Logs Insights is automatically provided for you. You pay for it by query, which is the one thing you have to understand about it. You pay by the amount of logs you scan. But it's a very, very powerful um, way to extract data from structured logs and do aggregations on them. So then coming down to metrics. So one of the things, right, one of the trade-offs that's really important with serverless is that when you deploy and use a service, you have to understand how it works and what its failure modes are. And what that means is that for each service, you should have a look at the metrics and what each one of those metrics means. And if you're going to deploy a critical application in production, um, it's a, you have to really understand what these are, particularly in the important ones. Uh, for example, if you've got a Lambda function that's triggered by a Kinesis stream, you, looking at the iterate will, iterator age will tell you how far behind the latest event your Lambda function has become. So if, you've got a, if you need to have events processed within two seconds, and you find that the iterator age has become t 10 seconds, then you've got a problem. 
but you can, under, you can kind of go through all of these errors and kind of decide what level is comfortable for us and when do we need to start creating alarms and alerts and responding and how are we going to respond. But beyond those service metrics then, um, you should also look at your business metrics and what business metrics you need to capture in the system too. So that could be you know, the number of uh, play button clicks on a video service. It could be the number of abandoned carts in an e-commerce application or the number of products added to a cart. And every business will have kind of a baseline expected level of behavior for those events. Uh, so by creating those business metrics, you can actually correlate them with your service metrics and understand your system's behavior. And apart from just looking at the technical details of the services, you can say, well, um, if the number of products added to a cart is, is, has, is showing an anomaly, if it's falling outside of the normal range, then we need to do something about it. And that's a good way to kind of separate your observability from just like the code level metrics. Uh, so this is one really neat way of adding metrics, and this is a fairly new feature. Um, so rather, you can just, most of the metrics we collect use CloudWatch metrics. So you can just put metrics into CloudWatch metrics, then it will allow you to build dashboards on them. Um, but this is a very low overhead way of doing it. Uh, so we're using a node module that AWS released for creating lo metrics logs. And what that does is it creates a structured JSON payload with the metric in it. And the CloudWatch service will then asynchronously parse that and create a metric for it, and it doesn't affect the performance of your application. It also means it's nice, you can actually see it then in your logs, and you know, know exactly what's happening. Uh, so this is an example from the Slick Starter application where we're tracking the number of items in checklists and the number of words in each entry. And then you can build up uh, statistics and check uh, what they're like, like the average number of words or the 95th percentiles. Then doing queries in CloudWatch Insights, like I said, it's very powerful. One of the things you get in every Lambda Functions log is a report at the end that tells you how much <coughs> memory your function used, how much memory you had provisioned, and how long it took to execute. Um, so using the query mechanism in CloudWatch Insights, you can actually collect all of those report metrics from every Lambda Function invocation over a period of time. You can parse them and then build statistics on them. So in this case, this is a query that we use to figure out uh, how to optimize our Lambda functions. When you create a Lambda function, you assign it a certain amount of memory from 128 megs all the way up to a maximum of 3,008. Um, and when you do that, the more memory you allocate, uh, the CPU and the IOPS of the function are allocated proportionally. So if you need more compute power, you need to increase the memory. So in this case, we're looking at, uh, we've provisioned 976 megs, but the maximum that's used over this period of time is about 166 megs. So we've over-provisioned significantly. So we can look at this and say, well, 95% of functions executed within 100 seconds, and 100, seconds, 100 milliseconds is the billing unit in Lambda. So if we make it slower, then we might end up paying twice because they round up in billing, it, billing units. Um, but you could also say, well, actually, that function, maybe it's more I.O. bound. Maybe it's just doing HTTP requests and waiting. So it doesn't need that extra compute. So we could reduce this down to a 256 meg function. It might execute in the same amount of time, and we pay much, much less for it. Um, so then distributed tracing. So I showed a brief example of distributed tracing. The idea here is because you've got all these loosely coupled components, you need to be able to kind of make sense of it in some way. And distributed tracing allows you to kind of monitor the emergent architecture of the system. Um, so this is how you turn it on in serverless framework. And then the code example shows how you use the X-ray SDK to wrap the AWS SDK. What emerges then is like a service map where you can see all of the traffic and data flow through your system. If you've used a system like Zipkin or Open Tracing, it's the same idea here. Uh, but you can also annotate each trace. So you can put in business annotations on traces and then you know, search for traces relating to a specific order or a specific business event. And you can look at the performance characteristics of them. You can look at whether any errors have occurred. Um, and you know, it's really quite powerful. You can also correlate them against the logs that happened at the same time and the metrics that were relevant at the same time. 
Um, so myself and Peter, who's sitting here, we've written a book on building AI applications in, sorry, building serverless applications in AWS, and um, it uses a lot of AI managed services. It's, a, it's about particularly about building um, AI enabled applications, but it covers a lot of these serverless topics. And there's a chapter in it all around uh, building observability capability into serverless applications in AWS. So I think we have some free code, so if anybody's interested in knowing more about that, I'd, I'd be happy to share it with you. Just let me know afterwards or send me a tweet or an email, and that'll be no problem. So just to wrap up then, um, serverless isn't about being a perfect system. It's about being productive and agile, right? So um, I think when you, when you understand that you don't have to look for perfection and get, out, get outside your comfort zone, I mean, there's definitely plenty of area capability to do that in serverless, you know, getting outside your comfort zone. It gives you a lot of freedom. Uh, it puts also constraints in your way, so you have to find creative ways around them. Um, and there are plenty of pit pitfalls, but if you check out Stickstarter, uh, hopefully it'll help you on your way. Um, please do feel free to contribute and uh, send us critique and pull requests and open issues. Uh, we'd love to see them. Um, so that's all I've got. Thank you very much.